Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Want the best all-around coverage of New York City politics, government, and public policy? Want information and insight on the arts, culture, neighborhood, and ethnic news in New York? Want New York City facts and figures, debate, and dialogue? Then go to www.gothamgazette.com. But do it later. Stay right here. To talk about Gotham Gazette, its missions, its accomplishments, how it works, and to talk about the issues. Election 2005, term limits, small high schools, the UN, New York's district attorneys, and a whole lot more on Mark Berkey Gerard and Gail Robinson, editors at Gotham Gazette. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. What's going on? You guys are the 21st century news. You are online, you're electronic. Talk about the Gazette. Talk about, you know, how it came to be and talk about where you're going to go with it. Okay. Gotham Gazette started in 1999. We're published by Citizens Union Foundation, which is a century old uh, good government group. Okay. Let me, let me, let me stop you right there. Right. Let me do a little parentheses because the professor has to do a little parentheses. <laughs> The Citizens Union are the Goo Goos, the good government right. groups, and being a, you know, a, a historian of New York City, they came to be in the 1890s mm -hmm. to overthrow Tammany Tweed, elected the second mayor of the greatest city of New York, Seth Lowe. So you are an established uh, organ of information and enlightenment. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, Citizens Union started out actually as a political party a reform party. Um, and then shortly after Seth Lowe was elected as mayor, they became one of the first good government groups and helped, actually helped coin that phrase, goo goo and good government. Um, but for a you know, century, we've been informing New Yorkers about the city government, what's going on, trying to shed light on uh, corruption, and just informing and educating voters. How did you, how did you get there? When it started in 1999, whose brainchild was it? It was the brainchild, of, I think, of someone named Con Nugent, who was uh, executive director of Citizens Union Foundation at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and with a grant from the Revson Foundation, they launched this way to uh, bring this new technology to this, and this very is, august this, organization. And this is the, the end of the 20th century, 1999. You right. guys come on. When do you come on, Gail? Yes, sir. Uh, 2004. 2000. 2000. 2000. Yeah, 2000 as well. So you, 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 you've been there virtually from the beginning. Right. The, the basic, the first idea was to create a portal to information about how the city government runs or uh, reports or audits. You know, there's a lot of papers that are out there with people analyzing policy. And the, the basic thing is to be a gateway to that. And the Internet's a perfect medium. And, and, and you fulfill that perfectly, but you're much more than a gateway now. You are a producer of high-quality analysis. I mean, your reports, for example, Gail, reading the, the smaller high school report or yours on term limits, these are really mini, mini policy analyses. You know, they're rigorously written, footnoted, et cetera. How do, you, how do you come to do this? Well, we try to keep it lively as well. Oh, no, <laughs> no, it's very accessible. It's um, very accessible. I mean, we've sort of layered on, I guess, more and more sort of uh, policy analysis as we've tried to keep the, the advantages of a portal site by having links at the end and uh, by referring people to other, to other work on the same topics. Um, how we come to put one of those together is yeah. that, it's a very attenuated process. I mean, we're always trying to sort of see what are the big issues in New York now. Um, and trying to see if there's something, that, if there's a policy issue involved. I mean, the bottom line for us, is this an issue of policy? Take, us, ins look out? Take us inside the newsroom. What is it like? You guys sit around. You, <laughs> the two of you, Jonathan Mandel, who's the managing editor and the longtime the editor, managing yeah. editor, former reporter at Newsday, and several other editors. 
how do you come to put it together? How do you, how does this come out? Today's, for example, today's Gotham Gazette, you've got what you just talked about, Gail, the portals to all these different topics from arts to the waterfront. Then you've got organizations in government. Then you've got boroughs, news sites. So you're a portal. But how do you put it all together? Describe a meeting. Well, we kind of think of, you're smiling. we think of uh, Gotham Gazette kind of as having a couple different um, ways of functioning. One is just a daily digest of what's going on in the news. You know, there's numerous daily newspapers, there's weeklies, there's, uh, you know, monthly magazines. And so we try to sort through what's going on every day every and day. make sense of right. it. So one is just we're a news digest. One right. is that we're, we think of ourselves as a policy magazine. To take something you might read a short article about in a newspaper mm -hmm. and look at the whole issue, look at the history, look at the uh, differing opinions. Um, one, another thing is just to make uh, use of the internet as a medium for research, but also provide ways for people to interact. We have lots of message boards, ways for people to post events, um, and to, you know, often we even have interactive games where people can, one of our interactive games was to balance the city's budget. Right. We put the reader in the place of the mayor, you get all the things he spends the money on, all the ways he raises revenue, and you have to balance it. So that's just that's it's a how great, we see it. It's a great classroom tool. I used both the budget game and your create a parks game. That mm -hmm. was an, an excellent. Uh, so talk about talk about Gail. You guys sitting around the, the uh, you're smiling around the table. What is it like? How active is it? It's, it's active, but it's disorganized. I don't. I mean, Go. I've worked at daily newspapers where every day you sort of sat down and you said what you were going to be covering that day. We're not that. We're not that organized, I guess. How, go we, ahead. We, you know, we 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 come together <laughs> uh, often on a rather ad hoc basis and sort of throw ideas around. Uh, Jonathan, the editor, is always coming up with thousands of ideas, um, some of which we can't do because of our limited resources. Um, when something happens, we we sort of try to think, what is there a story in this for us? Right. Um, take an example when the when there was a subway signal fire in uh, a few months ago. It immediately seemed like it was going to be a story. So should we do an issue of the week on it? Should we get a commentary on it? And then it seemed we have Bruce Schaller, who's a transportation expert, who's one of our regular contributors. Right. So that seemed like the way to go. That being Bruce was an expert, call on him. What could he contribute beyond what was in the daily newspapers? And he wrote a story about what this, what the lessons we can learn from right. this are. Which and it is came how out we fast. feel we sort of it came out quickly. Um, but that was what, how we felt we could add to the reporting of you know like cursing commuters and what you were getting on the, the news every night. And what? this week, week there is a good example. We have a story about AIDS in New York right. City. You know, a couple weeks ago, there was this story about this new strain. Right. Um, but what we did was, instead of just reporting on that one specific thing, to take a step back and look at AIDS in New York City. You know, how is it changing? What are the demographics? How, you know, what are the different kinds of treatments? To try to put it in a larger context. And you have what, what you guys call the issues of the week, which provides these in-depth analyses of, of news events. Mm -hmm. Arguments? Disagreements? How, you know, <laughs> what, what do you guys argue about? How, how does it happen? What's the dynamic? Well, it's like, you know, I think it's like any newsroom. There's, there's lots of opinions. There's uh, story ideas that people like or don't like. Um, and we're a small, you know, we're a small nonprofit. Um, and so a lot of it's just the scramble to get it done and with a very limited amount of resources. What's the story you wanted to do but couldn't do because these oh. folks just wouldn't allow you to do it? You know, it was just a actually, dumb I, idea. No, I have, actually have, I think we have a lot of freedom when it comes to this, in part because, because of the web and the way it right. works. Right, right. Yeah. I don't really think so. I mean, there are some stories that I've wanted to do, and Jonathan has said, "Well, our experts should do that," and that's fine. I mean, no, I, but I don't think there's anything where, where I've sort of thought that something was really important and everybody else said no. Usually, we have more <laughs> ideas than we have, right. you know, people to pull them up. What you know, what what psychs you up? What really perks your interest? What you know, what is an example of? Wow, my glad I came in because this happened, and 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 you jump on that story. Well, I think Gotham Gazette has had an influence, even you know, being a small website. A good example is the elections of 2001, when term limits came mm -hmm. in, the mayor, all the citywide officials, four of the five borough presidents, and two-thirds of the city council were kicked out of right. office. It was this huge change in government. Um, a little site like ours, we, we started simply. Um, 
but then it grew over time. What we, we did was on January 1st, we just put up an empty web page for every race in the city right. and said to our readers, if you know of someone running, email us. Well, what this did was it built up over time, um, and it was a project that the newspapers, um, you know, maybe it was too big for some of the newspapers, it was too small for other newspapers, you know, writing about one council race in, in the Bronx or something, they may not put that much energy. But what we did over that span was create, you know, the most comprehensive coverage of those elections with candidate websites, links to their contributors at the Campaign Finance Board, articles, and then digesting the news. It was a way for people to get everything. And one more spot. than that, you provide demographic and socioeconomic data, all kinds of census data. So when you look at the web page, I mean, particularly somebody who's in, as interested in local politics as I am, I can go to each one of those council districts and find out virtually everything. And outside of you folks, and periodically one of the dailies, and Brian Lara's uh, uh, New York 51 looking at those council races, you don't get the detailed, in-depth, continuous look at these races continuously. And hopefully, it, we don't just do this for the people who are in the know. That's part of our mission. Uh, right. And so a specific example of that is if you ask most New Yorkers who their city council member is, they probably don't know. Um, and so our site includes a very simple thing. You type in your address, you hit a button, and you get that page. You see who's running. You and the articles try to focus on the issues that are facing in the neighborhood, not just the horse race. Right, and it, and it is very user-friendly. Who is your audience? Do you know who your audience is? I know the chattering classes are your audience, <laughs> well, being a member of the chattering classes. How widely dispersed is it? Do you have a sense of the, the types of folks who tune in, if you will, log on? We've had... We've done tried to get at that. I mean, we have 100,000 unique visitors a month, which we're, I don't know how realistic, you know, what that wow. figure really means. And we have probably almost 10,000 people who subscribe to the eye opener by now. Um, we've tried, I mean, definitely we're read in city government um, by people who work for nonprofits in the city, by academics. But we do just have a lot of citizens who are interested in New York um, and come up come upon it from one way or another. One thing that's a little bit, been a little bit frustrating to us is that more of those kind of people don't know about us. Mm -hmm. It's sort of hard to break through and tell people that you're there. I mean, if you're in city government, you know that we're there. But if you're somebody who's just an interested citizen, you may not have heard of us. Well, one of the things that uh, may make people notice that you're there, Mark, you did a, uh, a story on term limits revisited in uh, mid-March. And it, it sparked an immediate reaction. One was from Eric Lane, who emailed you that day. And Eric was the executive director of the Charter Revision mm -hmm. Commission in 1989, has been one of the, the real scholars of New York City government, sent a 47-page paper on the impact of term limits as a response, but a positive response. And I know you didn't see this prior to uh, uh, today. Newsday editorial on March 16, 2005 reads, term limits at work. We admit it, they're good for New York City. And they go through their objection and says, we were wrong. And guess what? As the online Gotham Gazette noted in a piece posted Monday, chaos didn't reign. Representative democracy didn't turn into anarchy, and savvy staffers didn't need to wrest the levers of power away from befuddled employees to avert disaster. Now, your piece, how did that piece come about, and, and how did you put it together? Well, we're always looking for a way of how can we create a niche in a... A new, you know, in a city saturated with with news and information. So this kind of subject is a little policy wonky. Um, you know, it's probably not something that a lot of reporters are dying to write, but it's the kind of thing that we feel like we can we can offer, published by a good government group. Um, you know, this was a huge thing in 2001. Um, term limits will have some effect on this year's election, not as much. There's only um, the Manhattan Borough President and six city council members, right. including the speaker, who will be term limited this year. But we wanted to look back. Um, you know, when this was being voted on, there were people on both sides saying it one, on one side it was going to be absolute chaos, the city was going to fall apart, and on the other side that this was going to be the greatest rebirth of democracy um, in our city. And and looking back at it three years later, um, and so as far as putting it together, it's 
you know, I talked to the council members who had been there before and after, um, you know, a lot of people who had, who had been on both of those sides to see who had kind of switched, who had um, changed their opinion, um, and, you know, tried to put it together in a way that's readable to people who haven't really thought of the idea before. One, one follow-up. In terms of your sources, do you go back to, I mean, do you go back to the same sources, not to, to structure a story, but just to sound, you know, as a sounding board? There must be different kinds of sources that you have, some that are immediate to the story and some much more general that you sort of tap in all the time. How do you, you know, in this term limit story, you've got the idea, you run it past the group, it gets the okay, you go out and put it together. What was, I mean, what was the fun of doing the story and, you know, what, what sort of frustrated you on this story? Um, the fun, you know, actually term limits has been discussed since the first, you know, constitutional convention. So there's, there was plenty, you know, I actually like the research and the history of it and um, looking back at old clips from the early 90s where people were on the steps of city hall hall saying this is going to be a disaster and having that you know actually looking back that's that was fun for me so you get excited about this in a strange way yes <laughs> okay i've been there long enough to actually get excited about it term is, so. I, I i understand i'm in the same situation getting excited about term limits but at the same time you know as far as sources um you know we it depends on the story um but there are kind of a small group of people who have been around for a long time who, you know, have perspectives on this. And so we're always trying to push beyond that group. Right. To break out beyond right. the standard conventional yeah. wisdom. Gail, one of the, the pieces that I really enjoyed over the last couple of weeks was the your UN story, which really to me is somewhat, I only became enlightened after reading the piece. It was somewhat unfathomable. The, the amount of dislike, indeed hatred, toward the UN on the part of legislators and government. And, and, and you're also your piece on making high school smaller. I just want to touch on those two pieces. Sure. Start with the, 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 the high school piece, because in some sense you're beat, if you will, even though you guys don't have a beat. You write about everything. You focused in, provide a lot of attention toward the schools, school funding, the campaign finance, you know, the finance equity, uh, campaign for finance equity. Yeah, I'll get it right eventually. <laughs> Talk to me about this making high school small. How did you come to it? And what's the bottom line here? Because I don't get it. I mean, you've got a huge school and you make it into four separate schools. I mean, do you literally physically divide it? Do you have different curriculum? What, what's the story with these schools? Well, they are somewhat doing that. Um, they've decided, uh, uh, Chancellor Klein and the people who work for him, along with people from outside foundations like the uh, Gates Foundation, that large high schools in the United States have failed a lot of kids. The old model of the comprehensive high school that most of us probably went to. Right. Um, and they've come up with this idea of small schools saying that children will get uh, more attention, that they won't get lost in the system, that they can be focused more on the kids' interests. Um, so there's been a lot of money out there to do this, which is one thing that's definitely driving this, not only in New York, but in other cities throughout the country. Uh, but also a desire to fix, I think a sincere desire to fix something that really is broken. The problem is, is like so much in education, I think it's become a little bit of a gimmick. Um, not that there are a lot of these small high schools aren't good and serving kids well, but there are also a lot of big high schools in the city that serve people well, mm -hmm. something we tend to lose mm -hmm. sight of mm -hmm. when we talk about mm -hmm. the failing ones. And some people say that many of the things, it isn't, you can't just break a big high school into a little high school and say that works. They tried that at Erasmus, they tried it at Harry Van and Arsdale, it didn't work. Um, what they have done is, when they break them now into small high schools, they've made class size smaller, they've given the kids more... Which could explain the, the positive results That's what of some the class people say, size, exactly. Right. They've given the kids more individual supervision, they've had a more focused curriculum. So it's not just a small school, it's, it's sort of recasting the high school. People at larger high schools say, well, hey, if you did that for us, we'd work too. Right. What they've done instead is sort of starve the large high schools. So you had the prospect of while you were making these small high schools, you were doing things at some of the best high schools in the city, like Midwood and Cardoza, mm -hmm. making classes bigger, sort of undercutting what they were doing. So okay. it isn't that it's a bad idea, it's just different. Okay, which different. brings us to the larger issue, and you've been focusing on you know, education for a while. General assessment of the reforms. Wow. <laughs> well. Major problems then. 
I think opportunities. They've, they've certainly done some things that I think most people think were probably good. Uh, I don't think I think the uniform curriculum to some extent people probably support because a lot of kids, particularly the poorest kids in the city, tend to move a lot and then they'd be get into a new school and they wouldn't know what was going on just because the school was teaching an entirely different kind of math or whatever. Um, I think a lot of the problem has been with, with implementation. If you talk to teachers, if you talk to parents, they feel it's a very undemocratic with a small d sort of system. They got rid of the community school boards, which many of which were plagued with problems and many of which were just out and out corrupt. Mm -hmm. But they haven't put anything in its place. And it's very, very hard for a parent to have any real input. Um, teachers complain that they're a lot more micromanaged. And this seems to be re resented a lot, particularly by good teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, who feel that that sort of their their idea to sort of go with where the kids are going um, is undercut by having to do these lessons plans. Some of them say, well, the lesson plan is just kind of fiction because I have to do it. But if I really followed it, I wouldn't be serving my students well. So mixed bag? Mixed bag, yeah. Uh, potholes ahead, opportunities ahead? Well, you know, there, there's so much emphasis on testing now. We're going to be getting a lot of test scores this, you know, right before the election, well, this spring, there'll be a lot of test scores coming out. Mm -hmm. Uh, if they and everybody's going to try to spin them the way they can. Right. And most likely it'll be a mixed bag. You know, there'll be some that are up, some that are down. Right. Everybody will be able to say what they. But if they come down showing something that there's really been a huge growth, or if that there's really been a huge decline, that's either going to be a plus or minus for the mayor. Okay. Piece that interested me was the piece on hotels that you've done relatively recently. Clearly. Uh, it resonated given the conflict over the conversion of the plaza to mainly condominiums. What What is the future of the hotel industry in New York, and are we going to be losing these landmarks, and should we, in a sense, lose these landmarks to the forces of the market? Yeah, the story I did, you know, the idea for it came from the mayor saying repeatedly, that more tourists are visiting the city than ever before, that tourism you know, is on the boom, hotel prices are up, vacancy rates, you know, they're, the hotels are full. And so that was kind of the initial idea. And then as you start to look around, there's different trendy hotels going up in neighborhoods. You know, Harlem is getting its first hotel in 30 years. Um, the mayor's put a lot of stock in his West Side plan, which includes the convention center and the stadium, but a lot of it you know, is connected to the hotel industry, and in order to help pay for it, the hotel industry agreed to this a tax, a dollar fifty tax for every key in the city. Um, and then at the same time, you see things like these old established hotels, like the Plaza. The real estate market is so hot that they can make more money um, by changing their hotel rooms into condos. And so there's you know all these different things going on at once. I think. Um, the overview is that the the number of hotel rooms are not actually growing that much, um, maybe a little bit. But there's new development in different neighborhoods that haven't seen it before, while some of these long-time ones are, you know, are shrinking. Okay, so, it's, but it, but there's a lot of implications. There's implications for jobs. There's, you know, for tourism. Um, at what point do the uh, rates get so high that people go elsewhere, that conventions don't come here? It's all a balancing act. Really. Well, I mean, in part, is there, a, is there a, a problem with the mayor developing the west side with a stadium and other facilities that he argues are going to bring in more people if we don't have the absorptive capacity? Do we, in fact, reach a threshold and the, the lack of rooms begins to break this development? So you're stimulating development, but at the same time, you could be creating a, a huge problem down the line. Right. The mayor's plan with the west side is um, centers around the convention center expansion. And his argument is this isn't just a football stadium for the Jets to play in uh, 10 games a year. This is going to be a way to bring business to the city, to bring conventions. They'll be able to host these huge events where 75,000 people can sit in it. Um, and that's why his, that's his argument why it should be on the west side next to the convention center and not in Queens, where it would be just used for just football. Did this story surprise you that it has had the, the effect of almost sucking the air out of the, the rest of the news cycle, if stadium you will? story? Yeah, the stadium. It, it's stadium media. Well, it's, you know, if for the Democratic candidates who are running for mayor, it's almost like a gift. 
um, you know, the mayor, crime is down, the economy is improving, he made it through a, a difficult, um, you know, fiscal situation the last couple of years. Um, and so, but his, uh, you know, his obsession with this West Side Stadium is a clear way for the Democrats to say how they're different than Bloomberg. And so basically, the two things that the Democrats have been saying, you know, the, the campaign's very early, we have a long way to go, but they just keep saying every day that the, you know, the stadium's a bad idea and that the mayor's out of touch. And those are the two things that just keep I think also being that, written about. Oh, sorry. I, I think also that it, it gets again to the mayor is whether he's autocratic and dictatorial right. because the fact that the stadium does not have to go through city council, that he certainly wouldn't want a referendum on it. So it's again seen, I think, as some people, he gets together with his millionaire friend who owns the Jets, and they, they concoct this well, thing whether people want it or not. And in fact, I mean, the, the Cablevision bomb sort of exploded that and, and, and brought it to the public. And this is a story that changes every day. You know, there's a, a new bid. The bids have been changed. There's new partners. When you've got Cablevision and the Jets, two powerful, rich organizations waging war against each other, um, you know, it's a story that just won't die. <laughs> is, there, is there another story lurking out there that you guys have some, you know, glimmers of that could be a, a stadium story? What, what, what's, what's not, what do you see? Is there anything on the horizon? Give us a little peek. Anything going on? No, I think, I think education is going to become a big issue in yeah. the campaign. That's, you know, the mayor got control of the city schools. Other mayors have wanted to do that in the past. He's the first one. And he said, you know, in his campaign last time and since he's taken office, that he wanted to be judged on the schools. Okay. And, and so at some point, you know, that... That'll happen. Kind of Go ahead. But then how do you judge him? I mean, right. that's, that's right. what it okay. comes down to. Schools are not... You know, you can say a stadium was built or it wasn't built, mm -hmm. but with schools and with 1.1 million kids with a variety of needs and uh, what's success and what isn't, what's great for one kid is a failure for another child. You guys do predictions. Or, no, you don't do predictions. You publish predictions of, you know, various and sundry New Yorkers. I'm not going to ask you for a prediction of the outcome of the Democratic primary or the election, but what's your analysis looking forward right now? If you had to lay odds, what's your analysis? Well, you know, again, it's very early. A lot can happen. Uh, there's four Democrats. Um, you know, I think Fernando Ferrer has the best name recognition in the city. A lot of people voted for him last time or, or didn't vote for him, but they at least know who he is. Um, and so, so far the Democrats haven't started really talking. They've been doing the I'm against the stadium, the mayor's not. Um, those debates are, will start this month. Um, I think the first one where all four of them will show up is in about two weeks. Right. And they will have to start, you know, laying out how they're different from each other. You know, Anthony Weiner, C. Virginia Fields, Gifford Miller, and Fernando Ferrer. You get the last word. What do you say? Well, I mean, I would agree that Ferrer, you know, Ferrer certainly has the biggest name recognition. I think it's also all going to change when the mayor's money starts kicking yeah. in in a public way. We, I mean, he's already spending it, but not in a way that the public sees He already sees spent it. $5 million, which is almost as much as the Democrats are allowed right. to spend. So I guess when you're against the $4 billion gorilla, it's going to be tough. Right. And it's also tough when you only have a half hour talking to two people like you. You'll have to come back. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. My pleasure.